you know, it's one of the... All right, so um, let me just start with a little bit of context. Um, in 1979, I was working on my master's degree and discovered that Elie Wiesel was teaching at Boston University. Um, I was at a different institution in the Boston area, and I managed to, um, to get a spot in his classes. Um, there he is. And in 1981, when I graduated with my master's, he said, when you're ready to do your doctorate, come back. You have a place with me. Uh, and in 1986, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, if I don't go back and get my degree, despite the fact that there's no jobs for people with PhDs in literature and religion, I will regret it for the rest of my life. So I went into my degree program with not very, you know, ambitious aspirations, if you will. Uh, but rather just to, to do something that was uh, important. And I went and I had my first meeting with him in September of 1987, and he said to me, he said, I have a study I want you to do if you're interested. I said, okay, what's that? He said, I want you to do your dissertation on Holocaust survivors who became writers after the war and then died by suicide. Primo Levi had killed himself in 1986. They were close friends. Um, and so it was on his mind. So I said, okay, let me uh, think about it. 1987, there were six that we knew of at that point. And I read everything I could get my hands on. There was no one to study with. I didn't know Terry Maltzberger was in Boston or else I would have sought him out. And I knew nothing about suicide. And again, I'm doing this as a non-psychologist. So I discovered the voices that I needed to hear. Uh, Schneidman, Farborough, Lippmann, Maltzberger, and read just literally everything I could get my hands on, which in 1987, 88 was not easy because we didn't have the internet. So everything that you read, you read ink on paper, uh, and you sought it out and you brought it. And so it was there that I dis discovered Schneidman. I really liked his work a lot, and I wanted to apply his theory in my, as an analytical framework for my work with these, uh, what then was eight uh, men who died by suicide in 1990, in addition to the six that we already had, there were two more. And, um, and I wanted to meet him. So my husband and I, who were both poor graduate students um, and living in a dorm, uh, decided to scrape up, scrape up enough money so I could go to the San Francisco meeting of AAS. And I wrote him a fan letter, sent him my prospectus, I said, um, here you go, um, is there any chance that, you know, I could, you know, meet you? And so we had lunch together. Uh, I bought a sandwich, pastrami, I didn't eat it, um, and he interviewed me a bit, and then he did what he always did, he did this, uh, <sighs> all right, I will read things. Um, and so that is how it began. I did my writing phase in Nairobi with my newborn daughter, um, and he and I spoke uh, several hours a week. Thank goodness he called me, because I had no money. So this is my dissertation, um, and this is kind of what it looks at. Um, the function of writing, a close reading of texts, available biographical information. I did no interviews at all. Uh, I wrote a few letters, I got a few responses, uh, but nothing directly related to any of the gentlemen I studied, with the exception of Primo Levi and one letter uh, of a friend. This is the list in the order in which they died. They came from different areas, they had different experiences, they had different backgrounds, um, but all of them killed themselves at some point. For today, however, because there's no time to go over all of them, we're going to focus on Borowski. And I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly because there's a lot of biographical information. Um, 
He was not born in Poland, but he had Polish parents who had um, been both sent to gulags for much of his childhood. He first was in an orphanage, then raised uh, to, for some years with his aunt, and after his parents returned and they returned to Warsaw, um, he was set to study at a Franciscan school, a boarding school, because he could study there for almost nothing. And it relieved the family of feeding him uh, and gave, them, uh, gave him a good education. Um, after the Nazis occupied Poland, he went to the underground Warsaw University, where he also published his own poetry that he printed off on mimeograph machines quite illegally. And along the way, he fell in love with Maria Rundo. Um, on 25th of February, he was arrested at the same apartment where Maria had been arrested the day before, along with Mankiewicz. Uh, and it was Mankiewicz's flat. Uh, in his pocket was a copy of Brave New World, um, and he, it is said, was able to watch the Warsaw Ghetto burn from his prison cell. They both were sent to Auschwitz. Of course, uh, Maria was in Birkenau, uh, and, and I, it's hard to know whether they actually saw each other, but um, in 1944, he was in Dautmergen, and then 45 to Dachau, liberated by the 7th American Army on the 1st of May, 1945. He went to uh, DP camps uh, and finally returned to, to Warsaw in 1946. <clears throat> he was after Maria to come back from Sweden, uh, where she was in a hospital recovering from tuberculosis. And finally, and she didn't want to go back. She did not want to go back to communist Poland, uh, but he managed to convince her, so she went back. <coughs> and they were married uh, that December. He had been writing stories, not only poetry, but prose, and he finally locally published his concentration camp stories, which were apparently quite shocking at the time. But he was searching for some place to be in 1948. He declared himself a communist, along with a, a great number of other intellectuals across Europe and around the world. In 1949 to 50, he was sent to Berlin, where he was a cultural attaché to the Polish administrative office. Uh, he won some prizes. Jan Kott calls the writing that, for which he was awarded prizes dull and one-dimensional and nothing more than the impassioned journalism of hate. We know that he bought a copy of The God That Failed, which is a, a collection of essays uh, by authors uh, like Kestler, who talk about their search to improve humanity through, through aligning themselves with communism, finally becoming disappointed with communism and rejecting it. Um, but he was steadfast in his communism. He wrote articles. Uh, he even uh, accepted a commission to write a biography of the Polish founder of the Secret Service. It's unclear if he ever uh, finished that biography. On June 26, 1951, his daughter was born. Maria was still in the hospital with the baby. On the 1st of July, he turned on the gas. He uh, died two days later at hospital at the age of 29. And he was buried in the military section of the National Cemetery. He did have previous suicide attempts. Maria had found him nearly unconscious in their flat in 1943, a few weeks before they were arrested and he again attempted in March, in a March or April in 1951. That's the background. My analysis looked at personality, uh, the, the profiles that, that Schneidman uh, liked from his mentor, Henry Murray, um, and for all eight of, of these men, abandonment had a great deal to do with their state of mind and what, and what they were going through. Um, his parents, again, were taken from him, uh, and he also had a great deal of anxiety <coughs> around Maria as well. Uh, and he wrote her poetry, much of which is included in This Way for the Gas, and, and the, the book itself very much is, is uh, written in the form of letters to her. I know you are alive. How else could there be meaning in the light and shadow of the cold, distant stars? 
I know suddenly the circle of our love will open. A careless movement of my hand will frighten you, and you will leave. So this anxiety that even Maria will ultimately abandon him. He had this great hope for survival, for reunion with her, which is often an important defense in Holocaust survivors, but this was marred by that uh, ever-present fear. But he had hope, and this is expressed uh, often in his poetry and his prose. Um, he longed for a better world in which there is love between men, peace, serene deliverance from our baser instincts. He had a lot of uh, baser instincts. He suffered from a great deal of rage. In his time um, after the war near Munich and then in Berlin, he writes a lot of poetry about this um, struggle that he has with his anger towards the Germans. And he talks about walking through Munich in his poetry and seeing women in their fine clothing and babies in strollers. And, uh, and he says, if I, you know, he's, he's thinking about these babies. If I took one out of a stroller and whirled it by its little leg and smashed it against the pavement, would it crack open or wouldn't it? Clearly, fantasies of, of, of revenge, of vengeance. I walk, I think, even after ages and the fullness of time, vengeance will return like a wave and drown this tribe, and their bones will rot unburied on the roads, and their cities laid waste. Grant this as soon as possible, O Lord, amen. Let what yesterday was saved from fire today fall from bombs and mines to fulfill the divine law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. May your nation perish with the fire of its smoking ruins, and may children in their mother's wombs be poisoned, shot, or gassed. Contrast this with um, a, something that's from This Way for the Gas, where he's describing the n one night of work on the train platform, unloading passengers, suitcases, and corpses. And he says, I go back inside the train. I carry out dead infants. I unload luggage. I touch corpses, but I cannot overcome the mounting uncontrollable terror. I try to escape from the corpses, but they are everywhere, lined up on the gravel, on the cement edge of the ramp, inside the cattle cars, in the silence that settles over nature at this time of day, the human cries seem to rise all the way to the sky. So there's this, it's almost, um, here he's, he's thinking that maybe it would be appropriate if for those in Munich, um, the children perish in the same way that so many perished in the camps. He was ashamed. And here we are with, with, uh, with the shame work, uh, which is something, Amy, that I've, I've been playing with as well, just recently. Um, he expresses his shame about not having done more. You know, there he was just writing poetry when his friends were in the resistance and he did nothing but write poetry. And he said, perhaps it would not have been wasted if I'd killed just one single German. And he counteracted a lot of what was going on inside him through writing. He wrote to grapple with his experiences. And the passage that I just read you, I go back inside the train, is one of them. Here's another. The roads were completely black, but I could distinctly hear the faraway hum of a thousand voices. The procession moved on and on, and then the entire sky would light up. There would be a burst of flame above the wood and terrible human screams. I stared into the night, numb, speechless, frozen with horror. My entire body trembled and rebelled, somehow even without my participation. I no longer controlled my body, although I could feel its every tremor. My mind was completely calm, only the body 
seemed to revolt. And his collections of poetry were also ways to grapple with his experiences, both his past experiences and all of the emotion and the conflict that was raging inside of him. But he also wrote to try to make a difference. And I think this is largely behind his alignment with communism. He saw Nazism as something that arose out of democracy. So he knew that democracy wasn't for him. He wasn't all that thrilled with communism either, but it was a better fit, and he certainly wasn't going to go by way of the church. So he did write these articles against, uh, around uh, enemies of communist Poland. Um, but while those around him were rejecting communism, gradually, the intellectuals, he stayed firm. And Milos writes an essay called Beta, The Disappointed Lover. Borowski is not mentioned by name in that essay. It was published before Borowski's suicide, but I have a letter from Milos. So I wrote him a letter. I said, is this who you are speaking about? And he said, yes. I was talking about Borowski. And he talks about Beta as a disappointed lover of the world who longed for harmony and purity, discipline and faith. And like so many other Eastern European intellectuals, was imposed, impelled toward self-annihilation. Miloš further talks about him as um, a man who committed intellectual suicide. And that's how he speaks of it. More of his poetry, um, which tells us a little bit about his frame of mind at this point. Um, how the dead will not rise from common graves, how your love circles above me like human smoke above the wind. This particular poem was written to Maria towards the end where he essentially says, don't come back to me. So it's unclear if they were uh, separated at this point. So thank you. Um, I could not uh, do the subject justice uh, in, in a short period of time. There's so much more I really struggled with what I would include and what I would not include. But here's from whence the title came from his selected poems. It was hard going through life an outcast. Like a book I took death in my hands, remember. So that's what I've got for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.